So in the movie, the character that's based on you, um, she describes the difference between a prostitute and a sex surrogate as being that a sex surrogate doesn't want repeat business. I'm wondering if, if you would like to expand on the difference between the two. Yeah, I would, because I get this, asked this question all the time. You know, I want to start out by saying I have nothing against prostitution as long as it's between two consenting adults. And I really think it should be decriminalized. Surrogates and, and um, sex workers, and I think that's a better term because I think it's less charged, have intentions that are different. If my friend Stephen Brown, who came up with this analogy, and I promised him years ago, I'd always give him credit for it. Um, he said that coming to see us was like going to, well, first of all, going to see a prostitute would be like going to a, a restaurant, looking at the menu, picking out what you'd like, they prepare it for you, hope you like it enough to come back and refer friends. Going to a surrogate is like going to a cooking school where you get the recipe, you get the ingredients, you learn how to make the dish, you share it, and then you go out and share it in the real world. I, what we're doing is actually in the real world. but, um, And I like that analogy. And somebody else came up with another one the other day, and that was if you go to an orthopedist because you've strained or broken or you know injured yourself, often they'll send you a, a, to a physical therapist. And I don't, I don't want physical therapists to get upset because, well, if they got upset, I'd say, let's talk about your sexual issues. Um, <laughs> but it is, it's like you do the hands-on work. Therapists can't do that kind of touching and, and exploring. And it's a gradual increase of intimacy. It's not about jumping into bed and have sex. Um, it, that'll happen sooner or later, but it happens, it's a very slow process of learning what really intimacy is all about. That actually brings me to my next question, which is, in the movie, we see that pretty quickly after some cursory conversation, the clothes come off. Is that at all accurate to, to how things would really happen? That can happen, getting undressed and getting the nudity out of the way. I just did a documentary for a British uh, television channel, Channel 4 in England, and it was they brought a young man who was 45 years old and a virgin, and um, he had an evangelical background, he belonged to a youth group, he had all sorts of issues around sexuality, not feeling that a, a good person would be intimate with, a, with anybody until they were married. And then he was 45 and finding, you know, he had never dated very much and had never, he was still a virgin and he wanted to be a part of this project. And we didn't get undressed for six sessions. And we, we took it very slowly. So I don't rush people. It's not about rushing them. We had 11 sessions. And, and on average, I would say between six and eight, and the maximum would be about 14. If you went to Masters and Johnson years ago to their clinic in St. Louis, you'd be there for two weeks, and you'd see the therapist, and you and your partner would be given the same exercises um, that we do with clients. So in the movie, we see the husband um, in one scene lying in bed tells Helen Hunt that she's a saint for what she does. And I'm sure that's a sentiment that you've heard many times before. I'm wondering how you feel about that sort of characterization. I always say I'm no Mother Teresa. I remember when I started this work, I, I said to my first husband, the one that's represented in the movie, um, well, I guess this means I'll never be first lady. <laughs> And I really didn't care. Uh, <laughs> I think of what I do is, uh, well, the first ladies matter, but I think what I do matters in, this, in the world just as much because I don't feel most of us walk away from our childhood with a real good sense of the rightness of our sexuality. There's always confusion. And I bothered from the time I left Salem, Massachusetts, and I was telling you I went to the Immaculate Conception, St. Mary's Immaculate Conception, from the time I was five till I was almost 14. And I walked away feeling horrible about myself. Every time I masturbated, I was sure my guardian angel was standing in the corner just going, oh no, here she goes again. And then I'd go back to confession and I'd tell the priest the truth because I believed, I was told that if you lied in confession, that was even worse. And so I was, you know, I was miserable and I bothered to figure it out and work towards getting to be a healthier person with the help of many people. 
I use therapists a lot as a wonderful tool. And my first husband was very open. I mean, he had his issues, but he was not a jealous man. So the relationship with him was much different than in the movie. I was, I was going to ask about that because we see a lot of a lot of jealousy there. So that was not present. Okay. So you really related to Mark then in terms of the, the religious background and sort of baggage. Oh, good. Yeah. I mean, he was from Dorchester. If you know Boston, it's a, it's a part of South Boston. And uh, I was from Salem. And we related, and the Catholic end too. Although he told me uh, that he, when we were together that he had to believe in a God because he had to blame someone. Uh, I loved it when I saw it in the movie with he and Susan. Um, but, and, you know, he had a marvelous sense of humor, but we really did relate. He still had this guilt. I mean, you know in the movie where he looks at uh, Helen and he says to her, I've always, when I'm naked, no, everybody else is closed. He said those words, and he was waiting for his parents or a priest to come charging into the room. I said, then, not today. <laughs> the movie definitely implies that your character experienced some very complex emotions towards him and perhaps even romantic feelings. Is, is that accurate? I did experience complex feelings. I did have, you know, the scene where um, we, he has the orgasm and then I hold, well, I actually held him in and he didn't lose his erection and I was able to have an orgasm with him. I kissed his chest. Uh, when I looked at his eyes, he had these beautiful blue eyes and I could see tears in his eyes. I said, what's wrong? I thought maybe something had happened and I was busy having my orgasm and ignoring him. And he said, and I had kissed his chest and that had, he had a, uh, they, they couldn't afford to do the special effects to really create Mark's body. But his chest went up into like a, a ridge. And I, I just, I just kissed him. And he, it was an emotional moment for both of us. And he did tell me he loved me and I told him I loved him. When you do what I do with people, there's no lack of emotion. It's a really good thing to be able to develop some, a friendship, a caring for each other. And I know I've been with people in the past and probably in, that, in clients in the future. Where we've gone through so much together and we have an experience like that and I love them. And I don't feel like holding back and not saying that. But I've actually said to Mark, I, you can love people right in the moment. And I really love you right this second or right these minutes. And you're going to have a more rich and more delicious relationship in the future with somebody else that you can have the, the full type of relationship with. And I worried that that wouldn't happen, but it did when he met Susan. So I was, I was kind of surprised by the scene where your character orgasms with him. Yeah. It seems so intimate and, and like she's potentially allowing herself this real vulnerability. Um, so, I mean, you just said that that actually did happen. Is that something that routinely happens? Is that something that's a bit of a challenge? It seems like you would feel so personally exposed. Yeah, you know... I think we're personally exposed throughout the whole process because, you know, we both do, we start off with being naked and doing the breathing and relaxing and doing well, communication. And then we do something called the mirror exercise where I stand up in front of a full length mirror and I'm nude and my client listens to me while I talk about my body, how I felt when I was growing up and how I feel now. And I can, I can always hear my grandmother in the background saying, you don't have to tell them what you don't like. They're not even going to notice. <laughs> and people will say to me, gee, I wouldn't have noticed you had a waddle until you told me. <laughs> or, well, I, ha I can't ignore the fact that I have a mastectomy. I mean, I have a reconstructed breast, but I had my, I had breast cancer in 2006. I didn't get a, a nipple made. It was another operation. I said, the hell with it. So I had a glue-on nipple. And, um, I'll tell you a little story. I had this client, and his therapist said to me, he wants to explore dressing in women's clothing. This doesn't happen all the time, but I thought, okay, fine, I'll give him honest feedback. And so he was, we were in the living room, and I said I'd get undressed in the living room with him, so I was sitting in a chair, and he was crawling around on the floor towards me, and he had a, a little cheerleader skirt on and a little top. He looked kind of cute, and no underwear, and I had my glue on. And I looked down at one point and I saw this horrible thing on his knee. It looked like a huge wart. And I 
stopped for a second. I looked down, my nipple was on his knee. So I reached down and I peeled it off. And he said, what's that? And I said, oh, it's nothing. It's, I slapped it back on it. I said, isn't it amazing that they can create these amazing pieces, <laughs> devices? And you know, we just went right on from there. But I mean, I'm always being vulnerable. Yeah. People tell me, you know, therapists who feel uncomfortable with surrogate work, surrogate practice, uh, say that the client is so vulnerable. So am I. You know, these are, like you said, the emotions that come up. No, I don't have orgasms all the time. Um, but when I do, they're real. I promise clients I'm not gonna lie to them. I'll be honest with them, and if I have to give them feedback, I'll try and do it in a way that is not scolding and, that, and they can hear. Um, because too many times when people get frustrated, they scold each other in intimate moments, and boy, does that take the wind out of the sails, you know? Yeah. The quote for the night is officially, I f saw my nipple on his knee <laughs> and peeled it off. Um, so I was really fascinated to read that your second husband, your current husband, was actually a former client. Mm -hmm. How did that relationship transition from therapeutic to romantic? You know, I always say that clients that I work with are not sick and broken people. They're like every one of us. And what they need is somebody to sort of guide them, give them permission, give them accurate information, teach them how to notice their own bodies and stop worrying about the best lovers are not men who have had multiple partners, a huge amount of partners. It's men who listen. And if you are with a woman or a man who listens, that makes a huge bit of difference. But give a person, when you're showing them what you like and sort of fine tuning what they're doing to, to make you, know, you feel better, um, again, back to giving them feedback gently. Um, when I met Bob, um, th th there was something special and it just happened. And I have not had that experience again. But we saw each other through the full, we had I think six or seven sessions. And when he was about to leave, um, I, he, I talk about it in my book, he brought me a camera. And I don't accept gifts. And he had seen the camera I was using, and he was always telling me what a piece of crap it was. <laughs> and he came in with this camera. I said, I can't take that. And his eyes filled up with tears. He said, I'm, and I'm just not going to do anything with it. I'm going to give it away to somebody. And he said, I just want you to have something you can take pictures of your kids with. Because he knew I was married and had the kids. And I said, OK, then you're going to have to show me how to use the camera. And I saw a little gleam in his eye. And we went to the Berkeley Botanical Gardens. And I have a picture of him in the book that first day we went out together, standing there with his bushy hair and that beautiful smile. There's another one I have that didn't get in the book of him walking on his hands across this bridge. And I thought, ooh, upper body strength. I love that. <laughs> and um, we stopped. We had that day. And then a few weeks later, we wound up going out again. And that was it. I mean, it was just obvious that we cared deeply. And, um, and it's, it's been almost 34 years that we've been together. So it's a pretty good relationship, I would say. <laughs> so I could sit here and ask you questions for days, honestly. Um, but I'm pretty sure that there are people in the audience who might have questions. When Helen Hunt first appeared and they've had their first session, it seemed like she was taking a very clinical approach at first. And then it sort of transformed from there. How does your work affect your sex life outside of work? Because it seems like there would be some sort of, I don't know, I guess conflict? Well, you do hands-on work, which feels great, but you're not doing a lot of kissing and holding, which are my favorite things, you know, being close. I used to wind up more, when I was a younger woman, wanting to have sex more often with my partner. You know, I'd, he'd come home and I wouldn't talk about work, I just, you know, feel I was hornier. Um, I'm 68 now and things have changed a bit, but it, it, it still informs that my body in a similar way, but with less urgency, let's put it that way. But it doesn't take away from my partner in any way. I, it's not because if we're not having intercourse or any kind of intimacy, which, you know, intercourse is just part of it, um, I, I'm, you know, it, it doesn't have to do with my work. The thing that's hardest for, I think, all surrogates is to not be a surrogate when you're with your partner to not be watching them and making sure everything's okay and noticing how they're doing. But I've learned to sort of do that with Bob because I know him so well. 
Um, and that's through years and having a history together. But in the initial phases, even with my first husband, who I knew a long time, um, I would do that. I'd be paying attention to him rather than being in my body, paying attention to my erotic thoughts and those things that keep you centered and being in the mo with a sense of smell and taste and sounds. And so I have to remind myself, like, you know, Doc, they're always saying, physician, heal thyself, do what you tell your, your patients to do. I, I have to do what I tell my clients to do. Go inward, be present, think, pay attention to your senses, what turns you on about that person that you're with. Something's had to have turned you on if you want to be that kind of intimate together and focus on all those delicious things. So I do that more and more, and that's the secret of letting go of the surrogate end. Does that answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> what was it like telling your kids about what you did and what is their reaction to the movie? They are now 47 and 44. When I started, they were five and eight. And I had been doing nude modeling at CCAC, which is now the College of Arts, and at uh, Cal and the De Young Museum. I was doing, I was working on trying to get over feeling uncomfortable with nudity. I mean, I was comfortable with nudity in my home, but the idea of, you know, just being um, comfortable with who I am, I was working on that a lot in my life. And I didn't realize it at the time I was doing that just before I started working as a surrogate. It was perfect timing that I had been breaking down some of the feelings of having to be perfect. When I went to model, um, I had kids. I had a killy, kitty belly, you know, after you have kids, you have your stretch marks and your boobs are different. And I would stand up in front of a class and I just, I learned how to pose. I belonged to the Mo Berkeley Models uh, Co-op. They taught me how to do poses. And I was a young mother and I, we needed extra money. I thought $3 an hour was fabulous. I, nowadays, I think models are making $40 and $50 an hour. But it was good in 1966, 67. No, I came here in 68. So it was 69, 70, 71. Um, so when I left the house this one day, they said, where are you going, Mom? And I didn't have my bag full of costumes and props and things that I would take. And I said, I'm going to go out. I'm working. What are you doing? I said, I'm working with people who don't feel good about their sexuality, and I'm helping them feel better about it. And they said, oh. And that's all I had to say. <laughs> you know, you, you tell kids too much sometimes. You did the, the basics. I mean, they're four and eight. And as they got older, I explained more within the limits of what they would understand. I mean, my kids are very smart. They know everything. I mean, they don't know everything, but they, they sense emotions and feelings when they're very little. So I, you know, I respected them and I wanted them to know what I was doing. Um, I've always done that with them. And that's one of the things I feel most proud of is that my children know I don't lie to them. You know, they can ask me anything and if I don't know the answer, I'll tell them I don't know it and I'll find out. I worked for San Francisco Sex Information for 20 years. I was on their, uh, their training staff for 19, almost 20, and on the phones for a couple of years. It was an amazing education for me. Um, I recommend it highly if you ever want to take their training. It's just so enriching. It shows you how many judgments you have. I didn't realize how many judgments I had till I took that training and I learned to just let go. You know, once I met real people who like to get tied up, <laughs> I kept thinking, why do people do that? And then I met these amazingly wonderful people. No, I don't want to do it, but they love it and they're nice people, so fine, good for them. You know, that's the kind of thing I mean by judgments about people being of any, uh, you know, sexual persuasion. I am pretty damn open. I know I can say no to things I didn't realize then I could. You know, I had a lot of sex when I was much younger where I wished I hadn't had, had be, I wished I could just go home quickly. And being a woman, you can be there. And I and learned that that wasn't making me happy. And I brought all this information I had learned about myself into my practice and learned even more while I was getting trained to do surrogate work. It was a huge transformation for me. You know, I grew up in 19, I was born in 44, so you get some idea of the years that I was going through school and when I was uh, younger. Thank and then you. I moved to Berkeley, and what better place to be? Hi. Uh, so you mentioned how your husband was kind of portrayed a little bit differently in the movie than his feelings about your job were in real life. Were there any other aspects of your relationship with Mark or the movie overall that were different? Well, when uh, Mark wrote the poem, a love poem for no one in particular, he sent it to me a year after we were together. We stayed friends, too. We stayed friends 
for the rest of his life. Um, in fact, I was with him on his last birthday. I had been telling him, would you like me to bring a lobster, you know, and sometime, because, you know, we're both from Boston area and we like lobster. And um, he said, sure. And he was, his 49th birthday was coming on and I called him and I said, I'm, I know your birthday's coming and I'm, I'm going to bring you a lobster. Would that be okay? And he said, sure. Because he had called me to tell me that he had met Susan. And he said to me, listen, I met this woman, a wonderful woman, Susan, and if you're thinking of coming by to, to see me, call me first, because I don't know how she'd feel about you. So I said, okay. I thought to myself, well, maybe someday he'll feel comfortable enough to tell her that, excuse me, that he had worked with me. Um, but that wasn't necessary for him to, you know, be with this wonderful person. And he said to me, and you know what I told her? So I was so happy when I told her I wasn't a virgin. And that made me so happy that, you know, he, and he wrote that poem in 1990. And he, when he sent it, the little booklet that it was in, and it was the first poem on the first, you know, as I opened the cover and I read it, for a split second, I thought it was for me. And then I thought, no. He wrote this because of what we did together. He now f knows what he wants to have in the future, and he wrote it to whoever would be coming into his life, and that was Susan Fernbeck. And we are now friends, she and I. You know, we've met through the movie. We've, got, we've spent time together at Sundance, and we've spent time together since then, and uh, she's just a beautiful and wonderful person.